This is a podcast for QI Central at the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. Ahead of our conference later this month, Dr. Matthew Matai and Dr. Helen Jepps reflect on the impact of COVID-19 and discuss the role of pediatrics during a tipping point in child health. Hi, Alan. It's uh, lovely to have some time to share a mug of Yorkshire tea with you this afternoon. Helen, you've been a good friend and a paediatric colleague for 20 years, and I'm really grateful that I was able to bend your arm to agree to the slightly unusual request to record our conversation today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, so I'm um, Helen, Helen Jepps. I'm a paediatrician at heart uh, with a special interest in cardiology. Um, And more recently, I've become clinical director for children's services at Bradford. So that's really having the lead role for general paediatrics, for neonates and for our child development centre and for the community services. So quite a big change, but I run both roles side by side, which is makes every day interesting. As you know, we're doing a session at the Royal College on social determinants of health led by the Born in Bradford programme. Social determinants is a massive area and for colleagues listening in, many may feel that engaging with this area sits outside their comfort zone, their sphere of practice, training and influence. However, I think we all feel that um, this is a crucial area that we need to understand better and engage in if we're going to make any meaningful improvements to child health and well-being. COVID has thrown a huge spotlight on this and I get the feeling we are at a tipping point and we all feel we should be doing something. So to explore this a bit more, I thought it'd be really useful to reflect on the changes that you've seen in paediatrics over the last 20 years. What do you think, Helen, have been the major tectonic shifts in our working lives and in our practice? It's really interesting, isn't it, thinking back to when we first met? And the changes have been massive. They've been immense. But at the same time, when I think about what we need to do and what we need to be doing in the next decade, there's certainly not enough. There are far more changes that we need to make. Um, And I was just thinking through for changes for myself. Um, Our role as consultants have altered. Uh, We're far more present on the shop floor. And that's great. I love it. We're interacting with the families. We're there with the trainees providing education. we work much closer, I think, if you, if you think of our nursing colleagues. You know, they, they undertake roles now that they just didn't do when we started off 15, 20 years ago. And that's brilliant. They bring something totally different for each child and each family. Um, electronic resources have been really interesting. If, if you think back to when we had our first consultant jobs here, you had the piles of notes, each with a little note attached to the front of Chase Blood Results or This Parent Rang. And now I bring my laptop in and I open up the electronic patient record and I have a list of messages to work through. Um, it, we've lost the impact of that pile of notes that used to really uh, let you know when you're in for a busy day. Uh, but yeah, technology has hugely altered. So I think there's a focus more on long-term conditions now as well, rather than just what's there in front of you. It's how can we have a more holistic effect for this child and their family And how can we impact on child health more, not just for the individual, but also for our populations? The last 12 months have been a particularly interesting time for us, um, sort of locally, but also obviously nationally and internationally. Um, What do you think have been the major um, sort of challenges, the difficulties, low lights, highlights of the last 12 months for you? Things altered fundamentally overnight. It feels strange now, thinking back to a year ago, we, we had... Um, that briefing where we were all together for the last time, really, that all consultants were in the room for a shared teaching. And I remember one of the consultants after saying to me, I felt like you were preparing us for war. And certainly there was this huge fear and adrenaline. We didn't know what COVID meant for children at that stage. We didn't know what it meant for us. And we were equally as scared as people in the community, but also had the challenge of making sure we could deliver services seamlessly through this time. And so we had this massive adrenaline rush. We were all prepared. We were ready on the battlefront, if you like to call call it that. And suddenly things went really calm and quiet. Do you remember it? It was really eerie, wasn't it? And we were there with our PPE and our newfound skills at doffing and donning. And the number of children coming through the door was a fraction of what it had been the week before. And that was sustained. And 
So our focus went to working with our colleagues, and that, that's been a real bonus from COVID. We've got to know our colleagues in the adult services. We've developed skills, and I'm so proud of you know, some of our nurses who were helping on ICU. You know, people were brilliant. We, we were helping with the paediatric ED. And then gradually the work came back and the numbers of children coming in through the door increased. But I think with increasing complexity of conditions, um, and we used to comment, we, we would think we'd be able to do the ward round rapidly, but every child would have something really difficult to manage in their underlying condition. But also that child and that family would have had it been impacted by social uh, distancing from not having access to education or not having access to, for example, the physio in the schools. And every child was harder to get to the optimal outcome for. Um, and now I think looking forward, it's even more challenging because our numbers are back but those issues are still there and we still have the rise in, for example, children presenting with mental health uh, issues. We still have increased complexity in safeguarding. So we, we're still already in waiting for the next year. I think um, the, the challenge is still there. So we lost some of our key partners during that time. You know, we rely so heavily on teachers and head teachers who see these children and their families daily to let us know when people need extra input. Or, uh, and, and we lost that and we really, really suffered from that, I think, for that period. But of course, it, w it wasn't all bad as well. It was really exciting because well, the transformation opportunities that came last year were phenomenal. And things that we had hoped and dreamt about and we had literally just penciled out, what, what are we going to work on in the next five years? we suddenly found that we were delivering things that we'd planned for three years ahead, but within a three-week time frame. And, and that was, well, I'll reflect on it in my retirement day. It was just, it aged me, but it was brilliant to be able to turn things around that quickly. That's real testimony, I think, to everybody working in Bradford and how they responded to those challenges. And as you know, Helen, we're currently part of a larger collaboration called Act as One. What are the opportunities and challenges there for us? And this is where it gets really exciting. Act as One, as you know, is relatively new and it, it's uh, really, it's just setting the landscape in Bradford and making a commitment from everybody working in Bradford to say, we're going to work together and we're going to design services together, um, looking at the priorities and saying, you know, where, where do we need to place this money that we've got and how do we use it to best effect and work closely with our partners um, and with the voluntary sector and how can we all make sure that we're collaborating and communicating and delivering services in the best, most effective way. It, it's still quite new, so it's, you'll be aware there's a number of work streams within Act as One. So I particularly um, I, I'm, I'm linking in with um, what we call access to healthcare and children's is at the forefront of that. And when even the first bit of that, the scoping of what could we do within this work stream was really interesting because you come and speak to the paediatricians and we say, well, this is what needs to happen. And then you go and speak either to the paediatricians at the adjacent trust and the list of priorities is totally different. You go to primary care, to the voluntary sector, and every area is highlighting different needs. And I think it's a really strong reminder of the fact that we often design services around what we perceive to be the best service. But what we actually need to be doing is getting back to what's right for that child, for that family and for the population. Let's listen to those voices, work out what's needed and then see how we work best together um, to develop the services. Uh, I love the strap line of it. Happy, healthy and at home. It, it couldn't be better. Now, how can we keep these children happy and healthy and at home? I think what's brilliant, Helen, is that, you know, I think as a team, we really feel that we've got a voice at different levels of of the system now. Um, can you look, tell us a little bit about your role in the West Yorkshire Association of Acute Trusts, WIAD? Yeah, so that's quite new, as, as you know. So again, if we go back a couple of years to w when we last had a really big peak in um, attendances to the wards during the winter period of 2019, all the trusts were working really innovatively to try and uh, manage the flow through the trusts. Um, and But what we weren't doing was working together. And I remember the week in December really clearly where we started picking up the phone to each other and saying, well, you know, what are you doing? Where are you up to? Are you um, seeing this challenge in the same way as we are? And you jump forward to now. And now 
I say it is new, but at least we meet. And that means that we know each other. We've all got each other's phone numbers and we've got our WhatsApp groups. And that was invaluable during last year, you know, keeping up with the guidance. But it means that now we're already saying, OK, so when our next challenge comes along, how can we work together to get on top of it? And as I say, we haven't got the answers yet. But the fact that it feels like we're tackling this as a team across the, the group of trusts feels a really strong position to be in. Um, we talk about the principle of mutual aid, and I love that. It's essentially, let's help each other out when things get tough, and also let's share practices and let's have a collective voice for what's needed for the families in West Yorkshire. And going back from, you know, from that sort of systems leadership roles that you have, um, Helen, coming down to the practicalities of how we look after the children in our own area, you recently were involved in regular virtual sessions with school teachers. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? How did you find it? And do you think we have as pediatricians a greater role in schools? So the short answer to how did I find it is terrifying. Um, it was another of the massive benefits from COVID. And I, I've already alluded to this, how we, we missed our, our partners and people that work alongside us in looking after children. And you know, all of the teachers and head teachers, they see children, they're part of their daily lives. They are so much more powerful than ourselves in uh, firstly detecting problems, but also in trying to influence change and look after those children. So it came around relatively early on in COVID um, where, where John had said to me, do you fancy coming on to um, a webinar with head teachers? And I found it really exhilarating, actually. It was one of the best days of a really difficult month because suddenly having the door open to you know, a massive number of professionals who straight away you could see how committed they were and, and you know, the amazing amount of innovation, what they were doing to keep children safe and um, you know, really hearing them supporting each other made me feel part of something bigger. And I think that's what we need to be aiming to do overall. And I'm, you know, I, I dial in every month. I can almost never answer all of the questions that they have for me, with apologies if they're listening, listening to this. But every time I take away, you know, just that feeling of this is great. There are a whole host of people that I haven't met yet in Bradford who are all working towards the same aim as us here. And I think the closer we link together, the, uh, the better. The more we link in, the more we share the problem and we know that we're all identifying the problems, the better I think we can influence policy change and we can move towards what we're trying to achieve, which is better health across, um, across Bradford for all of our families. I like to make it really relevant. I think it's everybody's role. And, and that doesn't feel the case, does it, when you're a new trainee coming into paediatrics? or a new consultant. Um, but what I say is every child, every child that's developed a chronic illness, often some of the, there will be some social determinants as to why they were more likely to get that illness. In the same way, if we understand the barriers that that family is facing in accessing um, health services, in accessing care, then we can try and reduce those barriers and we will make it far more likely that they will be able to work with advice that we're giving or perhaps a better way of putting that is we will be far more likely to give advice that is relevant uh, for that family. An example would be the child with asthma. When you see a child with asthma on the ward, you've seen our ward in the middle of winter where you've got children coming through the door every few minutes. You're really focused on the here and now. You know Who needs treatment now? When are they safe to get home? When can I get that bed free? Because I've got more children coming in. And it's so easy to really focus on efficiency and quality of the acute care and forget about the management of the chronic problem in the background. And that's one of the reasons why I love our ACE team, our, our um, ambulatory care experience team. We have nurses who are really trained in all of the social determinants that can affect how a family is able to treat children and also affect how that child might have developed asthma. And the ability to go out to a household and see a child in its home environment really drills home. You know, what's contributing to this? Are there things that we can help influence with air pollution, with smoking in the house, with the home environment? Um, are these families understanding what we're saying? Are we getting through the language barriers? Do they understand how to give the treatment? And just having somebody with a bit more time to really look at this 
and then see, well, what can I impact? What can I change here and now for this child? But also, what do I need to feed back into the system so we're not doing this well enough? That, that for me, is exactly how we should be approaching every, um, every patient contact. Thank you very much, Helen. And that's the challenge. How do we provide holistic care that is child and family centred while working in a complex system that can be difficult to understand and navigate? And how do we make sure that we do this fairly so that we don't leave our most vulnerable children and families behind? To discuss this further with national and international experts, please come and join us at the RCPCH conference to see how we can move forward from the data and reports on social determinants to on the ground solutions using co-production, data integration, and the potential of a life course approach. Hope to see you there and thanks for listening.